So I, I wanted to begin um, by talking about, let me put this in, um, begin with this uh, wall mural by Saul LeWitt, who was a wonderful conceptual artist and minimalist artist um, from the States. And he did these, these incredibly bold geometric um, portraits and, um, and statements. And, and people had really admired him because he was quite modest and quite reserved. Um, but the thing that was most, sort of most differentiated about him was the fact that when he created these great wall murals, he actually didn't paint them himself. He would send instructions to a team to actually design these. And this is actually one, um, I think it's 1996, it's actually a fax where he's just handwritten um, the instructions to create this wall art. And, and it sort of was a great inspiration, this notion of not having to actually do something yourself, but just actually enabling other people to do things. And it's a real transition in the design world where we are so, um, we are so attached to the idea of authorship. Um, and so that's what really led me to, to think about this presentation today, which I call Creating the Conditions for Change. And so rather than thinking about designers creating something um, for you, we actually are thinking really about how designers create um, sort of the, the conditions where um, other people can actually really expand the notion of design and actually become the designers. And so I'm going to talk about the designer's accord today. Um, and first I'm going to go through sort of a... Um, uh, a little bit of a landscape of where we are right now. This is, of course, I live in California, in Northern California, so you, we have the extreme pole there, save the planet, kill yourself. Um, everything from, from that in California to, uh, there's an artist in, in uh, Manhattan who um, is a young guy, and I've been following his work for about a year, and he literally goes around the streets of New York, and he finds garbage, and he puts them in a plastic container, and he sells it on the internet. And... Um, you know, it's genuine, authentic garbage. Um, and he's got all sorts of themes from the opening day, from, you know, the b different baseball things. And, and he, when I, he first started, he was selling them for $30 a box. And now I just looked last night, and he's selling them for $100 a box. It says something about our culture. So we have, we have these kind of opposing ideas about um, what is art and what is our personal statements. And things, new models are emerging now. And even though we're in this terrible global recession, it's actually really refreshing because people are having to think differently about how we solve problems. This is um, uh, just an example from a story that was in the Times about um, how new in the United States, um, which is such a bad penal system, um, how people who would ordinarily be sent to prison are actually being put into programs and they're reading, they're learning to read and then they're reading the classics. And their punishment is reading the classics, but it's also their recuperation. And it's, it's a really, it's, a, it's such an advanced idea if you think about if someone really was a, could understand the narratives of our time, they would actually be on a completely different track. And then we've got things like what's happening with consumer electronics. And for about the first 10 years of my, um, my career, I, I designed products, physical products, um, consumer electronics. And most products that are created, whether it's your, your computer or your phone or your radio or your television, are actually constructed by hand. Even in this age of, of um, mass consumption, they're cr constructed by hand in China. And in, in the United States, where there's the highest recycling rate, they're actually um, taken apart by hand. So some, there's something sort of ironic about these masses of people. I love this image. It was, um, I, I, it's, not a, it's not kind of a young Matt Damon film shot, and it's not um, something from 9-11. From it's actually these, um, this new group of police officers that are eco-police officers um, that work in New York State, and they, um, they go around and they, they're checking whether or not the fish is farmed or wild. So, you know, there's a lot of seriousness with this. And then you've got other things that are happening in the world, like, you know, the, the great benefit of actually having regulation, which is asking all of us to improve the way um, we operate our homes and our businesses. So there's a big mandate, as you probably know, um, to replace all iridescent bulbs with green light bulbs, so compact fluorescence. Um, but in the last week, there have been all of these stories from China, from all of these factories that are now... Um, feeding the demand that we have in the U.S. and in South America and, and in Europe for these bulbs because they're full of mercury. And so there are birth defects and people coming down with cancer at an extraordinary rate. And so it's not just an environmental issue that we have globally, but it's actually an issue around social justice. 
And, and I, I know that we, we talk about a lot of words um, around this topic, sustainability, green design, environmental impact, social impact, and it becomes this sort of sea of, um, of just language. And I actually like to riff on this idea by the designer Bruce Mao, who's a wonderful designer in Canada, and he talks about um, this idea of constant total length. And it's almost as if you had two fixed points in space, and what you have to do is realize that every action you make um, and every action you don't make actually is just tugging on one little piece of that string, and it has an effect through the entire string. So under, the idea is, is to, it's not about defining what sustainability means or what green means or social impact or social justice means. It actually just means thinking about the context of your actions. And, and this um, was a very personal beginning for me. Um, I... I um, Thank you, Peter, for um, the introduction. I have a great chance of talking to so many different organizations from the government to private sector, public sector in my job. And a couple of years ago, um, I was in front of you know, many executives and I, I just failed to engage them in appropriate conversations about why, why we were making another um, cell phone. Why were we making another radio? Why were we building another building? Why were we making, um, you know, a, pr a particular packaging project? Because it's so wasteful. And I sort of had a, 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 an understanding at the back of my mind about it, but I didn't have any of the right language. So I had this great opportunity that I constantly was missing. And so I started to do some investigation, and I actually wasn't very interested in becoming a, a, a sustainability expert. And I'm not still, although I have a greater awareness than I once had. And um, I had seen the movie, the Al Gore movie, An Inconvenient Truth, and on the DVD they have these little vignettes of things that have happened since the movie was filmed. And I'm a scuba diver, and they talked about this, um, the, um, the sightings of giant jellyfish off the, off the coast of Japan. And um, I was very interested, and apparently there have been many giant jellyfish off the coast of Japan, but the numbers have gone from three or four sightings a year to literally hundreds of sightings a year. So I did what every good 30-something um, person does, which is go to Google, and, uh, or any of us, right? Um, and I found this image, and it was absolutely shocking to me. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it, it, was a, it was sort of a terrorizing image, but it also brought up this big well of sort of indignation about this. And I took this image, and I wrote off a message, and I sent it to every client I had, every friend, every family member, and I just said, we have got to do something about this. And I sent the message off, and I was feeling like, full of, you know, sort of ego and passion and drive. And within about five minutes, one of my friends wrote back to me on email, and he said, you do realize that that was photoshopped, don't you? 